May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Before I really get into my sermon, I want to begin with a bit of a, a disclaimer, and that is that an ordination, uh, besides first, of course, being about Jesus and his church, is primarily about the ordinand as well. So the sermon I'm about to preach is a sermon for Tyler, but it's also a sermon for us as the church. But I just want to commend to you the word that Father West shared this morning at nine o'clock on this first Sunday of Advent, particularly in light of what this past week has meant for this congregation. Um, it's a comforting word, and I encourage you to go and listen yourself when it's up on the website this week. But this service is all about you, Tyler. So after all of those years of seminary and the hours and hours and hours of studying and writing papers, probably giving you a carpal tunnel, and all the time that you spent sitting in discernment committees and before ordination preparation teams, you've made it. So welcome to the beginning of your life in ordained ministry. And today we celebrate all the hard work that you and Megan, because it's a team effort, have undertaken together over these past few years. And we also celebrate the new ministry that you begin as a family here this morning. It's a great day for you, and it's a great day for the church as well. And so an ordination is always a special event in the life of the church. But there's something that makes this particular ordination even more special, which is that it's happening as part of the beginning of the season of Advent. So you don't normally see people in blue at an ordination. It's red, and our collect and propers from today aren't the ones that were read at my ordination to the diaconate, or maybe anybody else's. They're actually those for this first Sunday in Advent. So Tyler, I think it's safe to say that you're about to become one of a very select number of clergy who have had these readings at your ordination. But I think they're perfect for this day, not just for Advent, but for your ordination as well. So in this sermon, I want to do two things. So first, Tyler, I know that you are a Bible nerd, and I love that about you. I am too, I confess, and most of us clergy are. So I would be uh, remiss and do you a disservice if we didn't look at our readings and see what they say about this new ministry you're about to begin. And second, I would like to just humbly submit to you some brief personal and practical advice that I've gleaned over the past few years that I think the Lord wants me to share with you today. So in a few moments, Tyler, you are going to stand right here before Archbishop Bob, and he, or Father Wes, depending on how his voice is doing, is going to read to you the exhortation. And that exhortation is a summary of all of the work that you are about to undertake as a deacon. Here's what it says your jobs are. To share in the humility and service of Jesus for the strengthening of the church. To read the gospel and proclaim Christ at all times through your service. To instruct both young and old in the catechism. To baptize and to preach. To assist the priests in public worship. To guide the intercessions of the congregation. To aid in the administration of Holy Communion and carry the sacrament to those who are kept from the table by illness, infirmity, or imprisonment to interpret to the church the needs, concerns, and hopes of the world, to encourage and equip the household of God to care for the stranger, to embrace the poor and helpless, and to seek them out so that they may be relieved. That sounds like a little bit more than a full-time job, doesn't it? And the reason, Tyler, I read this list to you is not to scare you off before all of this happens, but because I want you to have these duties in mind as we turn to our readings from this morning because they don't talk about the specific tasks you're called to as a deacon, but I think they have a lot to say about how you're called to go about doing what God has asked you to now do. So first, let's take a look at the gospel reading from Matthew 24. And here we find Jesus foretelling what will happen at the end of all things. He says that the sun will darken, that the moon will not give its light, that the stars will fall from heaven. And Jesus says that he the Son of Man will come on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and send out his angels to gather those who are his own from all over the earth. The while his appearing will be greeted with joy by those who know him, others will mourn at it, as we sang of in our opening hymn this morning. 
And Jesus goes on to say that while this final day is coming soon, no one actually knows when it's going to happen except God the Father. No humans, no angels, and Jesus says not even himself. And because no one can know when all this is going to happen, Jesus tells his disciples to stay awake and to be ready, to be on the lookout for his return so they are not caught off guard by it. So today for you, Tyler, these words of Jesus are a reminder of the urgency that underlies your calling as an ordained minister. Jesus has promised to return soon, meaning that it's your job to stay awake and be ready, to keep the church both awake to this reality and to the realities of this world which desperately need the good news of the gospel. And yet, while this work does require a sense of urgency, it's not the kind of frantic, anxiety-riddled urgency that we so often experience in life or see in the world around us. It's a calm and assured urgency that's built on our hope in Jesus' return. Notice those two phrases Jesus uses to describe this kind of urgency. He simply says we are to stay awake and to be ready, to be awake to the reality of his coming again and to be prepared. So Tyler, today Jesus is calling you to take up this new ministry and office as one who is both awake and ready. Let's turn to our reading from Isaiah chapter 2. So here Isaiah is telling us about God's redeeming of the nations. It's a day when God will establish his house up on a high mountain, and he says that all of the world will stream to it so that they may learn the ways of God and walk in his paths. And Isaiah tells us that on this day, God will settle all of the disputes between the nations, and then that all the nations will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. He says that on this day, war will cease. And Isaiah ends by inviting Israel the house of Jacob, God's people, to come and to walk in the light of the Lord. So Tyler, there are two things here that I want you to take away. First is to notice the sheer scale of what Isaiah foretells. It's a day when we humans quit carrying out violence and death against each other. A day when all of the nations come together to worship the God of Israel. And it's pretty clear here that Isaiah is talking about salvation itself that day when God makes all things new and puts away sin forever. And here at the beginning of your life in ordained ministry, Tyler, Isaiah holds before you possibly the most important thing to remember, that the salvation and redemption of the world belongs to God and not to you. You So often in ministry, it's easy to slip into thinking that everything is on your shoulders, that one little mistake can derail all of the work that God is doing in the world or in your church or in your ministry. But that can't be further from the truth. Because God's plan of redemption is far bigger and glorious than we can even begin to imagine. It's so big, in fact, that God is the only one who can accomplish it. And this is good news, because it means that though God does invite us to join him in this work of redemption, to co-labor with him, the success of that redemption is entirely dependent upon him and his perfect faithfulness. So Tyler, your job, like my job, like the job of anyone who believes in Jesus, is simply this, to know him as our salvation and to point others to him, to tell the world what Isaiah does here, to come and walk in the light of the Lord. And finally, we turn to Paul's words in Romans chapter 13 which maybe should be added to the ordination readings we normally read. It's that good. And the first thing Paul does here is he points to love being at the center of our life in Christ. He says that to love one another itself is to fulfill the law. And Tyler, for you today, Paul is reminding you that love is what is at the center of your ministry. Your job is to see that the love of God is formed in his people. Paul's words here point to his great passage on love that we read in 1 Corinthians 13, where Paul says that if I speak in tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Tyler Paul's words here come with a warning. 
that you can accomplish all sorts of seemingly great things in your ministry, but if they're not rooted and grounded in the love of God as we know it in Jesus, then it's all worth nothing. So this week, we had a brief run-through of this ordination service. You can tell there's lots of moving parts, so we like to not make a complete mess of it when we're up here. And as part of this uh, whole rehearsal, we were talking about the part, if it's going to happen in a few moments, when Tyler's going to come up and lie prostrate on the floor. And at this point in the rehearsal, Tyler jokingly said something like, yeah, if I haven't run away before this part yet. And this fear is something that pretty much anyone who stepped into ordained ministry has felt at this exact moment. And Tyler, I'm so glad that you said those words because it shows you understand that what you're about to do is pretty scary. It shows that you know that the vows you're about to make here before God and the church are frankly impossible to keep in your own strength. The truth is that what you're about to undertake is only possible through the power of God working in you. It's only possible if you put on the armor of light, as Paul speaks of here in Romans 13. And that armor of light is nothing less than to be clothed with Jesus himself. And Tyler, above and beyond anything else, this is your job as a minister of this church, to put on the Lord Jesus, to daily be found in him, to daily be more and more formed in him and into his image. All right, so that's enough Bible for today. Lots more service to come. But before I close, Tyler, I want to offer you two pieces of advice as you step into your role in ordained leadership in the church. And the first is that you always lead from your own relationship with Jesus. And what I mean by that is in ministry, as you've experienced a bit in your time here, it's so easy to become overly busy with all the things there are to do. There's a seemingly endless to-do list. Classes, meetings, sermons, pastoral visits, counseling. That's just the tip of the iceberg. And oftentimes when we get so busy, the first thing that we drop is our time with God. And the trap here is that we start to think that our relationship with God is an accessory to our ministry rather than the foundation of our ministry. But the truth today and always in your ministry is that you're only as good to the people that God has placed in your care if you yourself are rooted and grounded in the Lord. The best way for me I found to evaluate this balance is by asking myself a question that comes from the pastor and author Pete Scazzaro, which is, does my being with Jesus sustain my doing for Jesus? Ask yourself this question often. And my second piece of advice is this, is lead as yourself. So Tyler, God has called you specifically to this office and ministry for a reason. And a big part of that reason is that you are you. And by that I mean God has made you and gifted you in a particular way. That's what the church has seen and affirmed in your whole process leading up to now. The counselor and author Dan Allender likes to say that every single life is its own unique story that's written by God to tell the world about Jesus. And Tyler, this is true of you and your story. You have your own unique story that God has worked in and through your life to bring you to this day. And it's a story that God continues to write. My point, Tyler, is that you bring something to this calling and this office that's totally unique, something that no one else can bring to it, which is you. And so often in ministry, it's easy to find yourself looking at other people in leadership who you admire and simply trying to copy the way they preach or teach or lead and while, of course, it's good to learn from those who are masters at what they do, your real task is to grow into the person and leader who God has made you to be. So in closing, I just want to pray over you um, some of the words from our collect as a way of sending you uh, before the bishop and these vows you are going to make. So Tyler, this is a prayer and a charge at the same time. As you move into this new season of your life and ministry, May God give you grace to cast away the works of darkness and to put on the armor of light, both this day and all your days. And may your ministry more and more reflect the person and character of Jesus 
both to his church and to his world. Amen.